All right, we've come to the last session, and we're going to be looking at, that's the way I feel, yeah, looking at being a woman who pleases the Lord by proclaiming the gospel. Proclaiming the gospel. If you would turn with me to Colossians chapter 4, Colossians chapter 4. Did you know, according to recent statistics, that only 2% of churchgoers actively share their faith with others? Did you get that? 2%. That is tragic, isn't it? I think of all the people who have tried to make a difference. I think of James Kennedy, who developed um, Evangelism Explosion, MacArthur's Church. I took that program. We were out there, uh, uh, Discipleship Evangelism. Uh, recently, Way of the Master, that's another one that is out there with Kirk Cameron, Ray Comfort, and Todd Friel. And, and yet, with all the, you know, the helps that are out there, evangelism explosion, discipleship evangelism, Way of the Master, uh, even a book that I really like called Tell the Truth by Will Metzger, which is a wonderful book to teach you not, not only how to share your faith, but how to turn everyday conversation into spiritual conversation, and yet with all the training programs and the books out there on evangelism, most of us in this room, well, I take that back, because most of you in this room are doing this, but most Christians are not obeying the Great Commission. They are not going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature that is under heaven, which were Christ's last words in Matthew 28. In Will Metzger's book, To Tell the Truth, he tells us why. You know why most of us never witness why we don't share the gospel? Because we don't start. <laughs> we never start. We don't open our mouths. We don't take the initiative. Maybe we, we worry about what other people will think of us, and we're fearful that we might lose family members or we might lose friends. Or I hear in the reform circles, if God is sovereign in salvation, then why should I share the gospel? That's a big one. <laughs> Um, oh, are, you know, Susan, if I share the gospel, then I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my job. Ladies, you can come up with your own excuses, but whatever excuses you can come up with, it's hard to get away from the Great Commission, isn't it? We are to pray, we are to go, and we are to speak. And we're going to clearly see these three elements in Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 to 6. So let's look at this together. Continue in prayer and watching the same with thanksgiving, praying for us that God would open a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in bonds, that I might make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward those that are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you should answer every man. Now you have an outline there before you. We're going to see how we should pray for the lost, how we should reach the lost, and how we should speak to the lost. Paul says, we, he begins, excuse me, in verse 2 by saying, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Now, ladies, look at the context, okay? The context is how we are to look at those that are outside, those that are without Christ. The context is the lost and the gospel. And the idea is that we pray... And we watch for opportunities to share with lost people. And we do that coupled with thanksgiving, Paul says, for the opportunities to share the gospel. You know, it's a blessing that God would use any of us <laughs> to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, we know that's the context of what he's saying in verse 2 because look at verse 3. He now gives a prayer request regarding the gospel. Here he says, he actually it's a prayer request for he and Timothy. Here it is. This is our first principle in evangelism, and that is prayer. We must pray. He says, pray also for us, he and Timothy, that God would open to them a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in bonds. Ladies, I find it very refreshing that the Apostle Paul did not think he was above asking for prayer. You know, I really like that. In fact, um, you know, sometimes my husband and I get in trouble for being too transparent, but that's okay. I'm not going to, you know, I don't want to cloak or hide anything. I want to be transparent with people. And here we see Paul being transparent. I need you guys, I need the church at Colossae to pray for me. 
And pray for me, not that, you know, pray for me that I'll get, you know, unchained from this Roman soldier I'm chained to, or pray for me that I'll have a decent meal while I'm in prison, or pray that my bleeding wounds will get treated. He doesn't, he doesn't ask them to pray for that. He says, pray for me that I will have an opportunity to share the gospel while I'm here in prison. <laughs> pray for me. Ladies, we need to be praying for one another. We need to be praying for each other that we will have opportunities for the gospel. And we need to get above the earthly prayer request to the heavenly prayer request. And isn't it interesting that Paul asked that God would open the door for the gospel? Do you know it's God that opens the door? And you know what happens to most of, well, not most, but some of us? We shut the door. He opens the door. Here's an opportunity, Susan, to share the gospel. And I slam it. <laughs> but ladies, we need to pray that God will open opportunities for the gospel. And I believe that's why we need to be praying continually about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, do you want me to talk to this person? Lord, open this door. Lord, bring someone into my life today that I can share the gospel with. Now, there were some obstacles standing in the way of the door being opened. And so Paul wants these removed. He says, pray for me that a door would open. And he calls it a door of utterance. What does that mean? Well, a door of admission for the word an opportunity to preach the gospel. Pray for me that a door would be open so I will have an opportunity to preach the gospel. In fact, you know there was another time that Paul was in prison and uh, he wrote to the church at Philippi and he says, you know, don't worry about me in here. These things have happened to me for the furtherance of the gospel. Don't worry about me in here in prison. <laughs> I'm having opportunities to share even with some in Caesar's palace, Caesar's household. And you know, we come to the end of Philippians, you know what he says, greet all the saints, greet those in Christ Jesus, even those of Caesar's household. Evidently, while Paul was there in prison when he was writing to the church at Philippi, he shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, that's what landed him in prison in the first place, was sharing the gospel. And he wanted to share the gospel more. And guess what? Some of them came to faith in Christ and at the end of the letter he greets them. And so he says, don't worry about that. Ladies, he says, pray for me that a door of utterance would, would open so I could speak the mystery. What's the mystery? Well, a mystery is a truth which was once hidden but is now revealed. It's just the mystery of the gospel. Paul mentions this many times in Ephesians. He talks about the mystery, which is the gospel, the truth of the gospel. Now, ladies, before we go on, let me ask you a question. Do you ever have a burden for someone's soul? Of course you do. I have a burden for a lot of people. I pray for all seven of my grandkids, you know. They will all come to faith in Jesus Christ. I have seven brothers and sisters, and there's only two of us that know Christ. I pray for my brothers and my sisters that they will come to faith in Christ. We all have people that we pray. But ladies, when you have that burden for them, we need to ask God to open a door of opportunity to share with them or, or pray that they will come in contact with someone else, not outside of family that can share the gospel with them. And I know many times I have seen God open doors for me, and then as I have mentioned, I've shut it <laughs> to my own shame. Paul was obviously very bold in his sharing of the gospel, so bold he wound up in jail. Because <laughs> Paul says, I'm in jail, this is why I'm in bonds. <laughs> Pray for me that God would open a door of veterans to speak the mystery of Christ. That's why I'm here, that's why I'm in jail. <laughs> because I shared the gospel Ladies, remember, Paul was very closely watched and guarded by a Roman guard and handcuffed to a Roman soldier 24 hours a day. You know, he didn't have TV and Internet and couldn't go outside and work out like they do in prison now. Nothing like that. He's in jail, and yet he's not concerned about getting out. He's concerned about getting the message of Jesus Christ out, but he's not concerned about getting himself out. In fact, in 2 Timothy 2, 9, he says this, For which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. But the word of God is not bound. Even though I'm bound up, <laughs> the word of God isn't bound up. I can still share the gospel with this Roman soldier and anyone else that comes in here. And that's, you know, I saw my dad. Uh, he had been very sick many years ago. He had 48 blood transfusions, and he was in the hospital I don't know how many times. And do you know what? Every time that someone would come and put a new... Um, pint of blood in my dad's arm and he would say do you know the life of the flesh is in the blood and then he would start to, do you know do you know Jesus Christ is your personal and on he would witness I mean there he is in, in the hospital bed and they don't know if he's going to live or die this was many many years ago and I did not see one doctor or one nurse that didn't come into my dad's room that he did not share the gospel with he found a way to share the gospel that's what Paul's saying even though I'm bound up in here 
I'm not bound to share the gospel. I can still share the gospel. Whoever comes forward, I'm going to tell them about the gospel. Ladies, this is a rebuke to our comfortable Christianity. We're fearful of sharing the gospel because we might be ridiculed, we might not be liked, or we maybe we don't, maybe we think we'll mess up the message, you know? But what if we faced imprisonment for sharing our faith, which, by the way, could happen. Could happen. It has happened already. You know, Debbie and I are going to India next week, and uh, the last time I went, it was a little, it was a little bit unnerving than the time before. Uh, there's a lot more persecution among Christians, and uh, I felt a little more uh, ill at ease. And, um, but, you know, in this country, we haven't had to face imprisonment yet because of being a Christian, but does that mean it won't happen? Good. How many of us would wimp out? You know, how many of us would fail to tell the message if we thought we were going to end up in prison? And how many of us in the, this room, if we did wind up in prison, would continue to share the gospel while we are in prison? Paul had a burning in his soul to share his faith. Ladies, we should pray and ask God to give us that same burning that Paul had to share the gospel. This is the great commission that Jesus left us. It is not an option for us. Well, Paul further elaborates on his prayer request in verse 4. He says, so that I can make it manifest as I ought to speak. What's he talking about? He says, I want to make known the mystery the gospel. I want to make it known. But he also says, I want to make it manifest as I ought to speak. What does he mean when he says, as I ought to speak? Paul not only is wanting to share the gospel, but he wants to present it clearly as he ought to speak. Ladies, a good message presented in a bad way can do more harm than good. <laughs> we have a great message. Christ died for the ungodly. We have a great message. But you can present that message in a bad way. In fact, Paul asked for a clear message and a bold message in Ephesians. He asked for the same thing. I want to present the message clearly. Paul says in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the power of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul says in another place, if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast on, boast of, for I am under compulsion. Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Ladies, we should know how to share our faith in a clear and a precise way. And then Paul reminds them of how they should live and act towards the loss that they're trying to win to Christ. This is huge. It's important. How do we reach the lost? Well, Paul gives the answer in verse 5. Walk in wisdom towards those that are outside. What does this mean, to walk in wisdom? Well, walking would include our behavior, right? We looked at that last night. Walking in wisdom means properly evaluating our circumstances and making godly decisions that we looked at last night, contrasting the foolish woman and the wise woman. One man says, behave wisely towards outsiders, always bearing in mind that though few men read the sacred scrolls, all men read you. Ladies, you can share the gospel of Jesus Christ all you want with all the people you want, but if you don't live it out, you might as well hang it up. You might as well hang it up. I remember going to a lady's house one time for discipleship, and um, I got there, and her kids were... It was bad, disrespectful, not obeying. And I said, is this what kind of goes on? She goes, yeah, I didn't want you to come today. Because <laughs> she usually came to my house for discipling. But this time I came to her house, and, saw, and the kids were there. And I said, you know, I said, you can go out and share the gospel all you want with all the people you want, but if you're not raising your kids in the way that God wants you to, you're going to totally undo all the gospel sharing you're supposed to be doing. If your kids are right, she goes, I know, you're right, I repent. And she did, you know, she did. And she started raising her kids God's way. So now she not only shares the gospel, but she also raises her kids right. She's walking in wisdom towards those that are outside. In fact, outside just means that. It's a reference to unbelievers. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4.12, walk honestly towards those that are outside so that you can have lack of nothing. Ladies, we must be careful how we conduct ourselves that we do not blaspheme the word of God and make it unattractive. There are enough Christians today doing that. <laughs> I mean, every day it seems like I hear about another Christian 
who's, you know, committed adultery or who's swindled money from people. And, you know, it's, it's in the newspapers. And we're blaspheming the word of God and making it unattractive. Who wants Christianity? You know, the biggest thing I hear people, why should I be a Christian? They're all hypocrites. And I said, well, yeah, that's true. But uh, not all hypocrites, but they're not real Christians if they're hypocrites, right? We have a challenge today, ladies, because Christianity to many has become a lot laughing stock to the unbelieving world. And we need to reclaim our testimony by walking in wisdom towards those who are outside, to the lost. And Paul says we also reach the lost by, notice what else he says, redeeming the time. What does that mean? We looked at that last night. But to buy up the, op buy up the opportunity to rescue the time, recover the time from being wasteful. Believers are to buy time like determined bargain hunters. Have you ever seen those women at garage sales? They're like crazy. You know, you're supposed to have a garage sale at 8, and they show up at 7 or 6 o'clock. Say, what do you got? I mean, they're determined bargain hunters. They want to buy up the opportunity. You know, they want to get the good bargains. They're serious. You know, Nikki, she's this coupon person now. She's a bargain hunter. <laughs> That's what Paul says how we should be when we're around the lost. Be intent on redeeming the time. Buy up the opportunity to share the lost. Oh, here's an opportunity for me to share the gospel with this person. Here's a great bargain, great opportunity. Ladies, the time that God gives us with the lost, don't waste it. Don't waste it. Make the most of every opportunity. Don't just sit and wait for the opportunity to fall in your lap. It's not going to, just like those good bargains aren't going to fall in your lap. In fact, Paul says in Ephesians 5, 15 and 16, See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, as we looked at last night. So we've seen how we're to pray for the lost. We're to pray for open opportunities, a door of utterance to be open. We're to reach the lost by conducting ourselves wisely, buying up the time with them. And finally, Paul tells us how we're to speak to them. There's a certain way we're to speak. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you can know how to answer every man. Now, what does it mean that our speech should be always with grace? Our speech towards the unbeliever should be gracious and joyful. Do you know, even when our Lord stood up there in the temple in Luke chapter 4, you know, he was reading the scroll, and when, it, when he sat down, it said, wow, his words were gracious. He was gracious. Ladies, our speech should not only be gracious, it, be, it should be seasoned with salt, which is interesting because not far from Colossae, this is the church that Paul is writing to, there was a salt lake. And so they would understand this imagery of having our speech seasoned with salt. Now what does it mean? What does this mean, having our speech seasoned with salt? Well, it actually reads this way, having been seasoned, indicating that our speech should already have been seasoned and should continue to be seasoned. And seasoned means to prepare with stimulating condiments. Salt has flavor, right? In fact, I don't know about you, but that chicken salad was good, but it needed some salt. Mine did, or something. It needed, you know, salt, it stimulates the flavor. It brings out the flavor of food. Our speech should be thought-provoking. It should be worthwhile. It should be stimulating. It shouldn't be a waste of time. It should be attractive. It should be, have spiritual charm. My husband's always saying we should be winsome. We should be winsome with the lost. Ladies, our saltiness will prevent us from being ignored as irrelevant bores. You know, I have met some Christians, and so have you, quite frankly, that if I were an unbeliever, I would not be attracted to them just because of their speech. I mean, I've called some of them on the phone, and they go, hello, what do you want? I'm like, whoa, sorry I called you. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I have, you know, calling Christian women to ask something, and I'm, excuse me, I'm sorry I called. Or, I mean, that's not an appropriate way to talk as a Christian. Um, or, you know, you... They have these sour faces and negative looks on their face. Who would be attractive to that? Ladies, we must remember what Jesus said. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, with what shall it be salted? It is therefore good for nothing to be trodden down and cast out. I mean, who wants that? Have salt in yourselves. He said, have peace with one another. Now, I'm going to give you some bad examples of unsalted speech towards the unbeliever. 
Do you know you're going to hell? You know, are you saved? You know, I mean, don't you know there's only one way to heaven? I mean, that's really attractive, isn't it? Does that win you towards me? Those are not salty approaches. Maybe hot pepper, but not salty. (laughs) You know, you could say something like, you know, in fact, last night, one guy came in there, Debbie and I were in the book room, and he was sharing his faith, about his faith and how he came to Christ, and um, he was telling us what a, li- what a mess his life, what a mess his life was before Christ. And I thought, wow, that's a great opening to, you know, you know, since I gave my life over to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that's been given such to me. I just got to tell you about this, what God's done for me. That's a great way. That's a salty approach. Or, you know, you seem to be struggling. Could I help you? I've often thought of that when I see women, those out of control kids, except I'm afraid they might take their Glock out of their purse and kill me <laughs> since now everyone carries a weapon. But I guess that'd be being, pers- being a martyr for Jesus, and my husband has always hoped that we have a, one of a, a martyr in our family, so I guess I'd be the first one. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I see those moms and their kids are out of control, and I, I just want to go up and say, can I please help you, you know? And, but I'm afraid that I don't know how that would go, but pray for me. Don't pray for me too hard, because that might happen in the Orlando uproar here in just a minute. <laughs> but... Um, you know, you could say things like that, or, um, you know, what is your religion? I'm just curious, you know, what is your religious bra- background, or who do you believe, do you believe in Jesus, do you, who do you believe Jesus is, or uh, one time I asked a woman, I said, do you believe in God, and she said, well, I believe in a God, and I was like, well, which God is that, you know, <laughs> so, I mean, there's all kinds of ways, and there's, you know, like I say, the Will Mesker book, Tell the Truth, he has some good openings for that, how to Take, turn everyday conversation into spiritual conversation. I think I told you probably uh, several years ago I was uh, putting gas in my car and I was on my way home from something and I went in to pay. It was at a time I wasn't using my credit card and I walked in and the guy goes, uh, boy, you sure are happy today. What's the key? And you know, I didn't say anything uh, to my shame and I thought, oh, I've got 15 minutes, supposed to be home to cook Doug's dinner. Like like my husband would really be upset if I was late because I was sharing the gospel. (laughs) You know, and I blew, and you know those opportunities never reclaim themselves? They never reclaim themselves. I missed the open door and I didn't buy up the opportunity that God gave me. Ladies, salt has a twofold purpose. It gives flavor and it preserves from corruption. As far as flavor goes, our speech should be joyful, witty, In fact, that's what it means in classical Greek. It should not be boring. It should be stimulating. It doesn't always have to be religious, but it should be properly seasoned. It should be gracious, seasoned with salt, witty, amusing, clever, humorous, but not, you know, foolish, jesting, and coarse talking. Nothing like that. (laughs) But our speech should also preserve unbelievers from corruption. We looked at this already. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. We're not to be using that form of speech. One man said this, Foolish remarks, ungracious, surly, cutting retort, saltless talk is vapid and from which the hearer's mind turns away because it is not worth considering. It never does the Christian cause any good. Ladies, Paul wanted to say the right thing at the right time so that he would not damage the gospel message in any way. And then Paul gives the reason why we should have gracious speech, why we should have seasoned speech. Notice what he says. So that we can know how to answer every man. (laughs) That man in the gas station that said, you, well, you're, you know, what are you so happy about? You're so happy, what's the key? Ladies, each is to be answered appropriately to his question and the spirit in which he asks. Peter says in another place, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you of the reason of the hope that is within you. And so our speech is to be gracious, seasoned with salt, so we can answer these people that say, What makes you so different? You know, in fact, I've heard from several of you this weekend and the people that you knew before Christ are like, who are you? (laughs) Who are you now? You are so weird. And what has happened to you? You know, you're so different. Ladies, we should speak the right word, the right time to the right person so we can know how to answer each individual. You know, think of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Remember when the spirit said, go join yourself to that chariot? And the Ethiopian eunuch was reading out of Isaiah and Philip said, do you understand what you're reading? And he goes, no. How can I accept some man guide me? What if Philip had said, you know what? I can't help you either. Sorry about that, bud. I mean, you know, let me go home and look at the John MacArthur commentary. I'll be back and help you. 
He knew. Philip knew the word of God so well that he could hop up in that chariot and explain to the Ethiopian eunuch what he was reading out of Isaiah, so much so that it says they went a little bit further and the Ethiopian eunuch said, here is water. What hinders me to be baptized? Philip said, nothing. They stopped the chariot, he baptized him, and Philip went on his way, and the eunuch went away rejoicing. He didn't see Philip anymore, but hey, he had salvation. <laughs> Philip knew how to share the gospel with him. He knew what Isaiah meant there. That's what Paul is saying. Be ready, be ready. Well, how do we pray for the lost? We pray that doors would be open and we would present the message clearly. How do we reach the lost? By conducting ourselves with wisdom. How do we speak to the lost? With gracious and salty words. Ladies, if you do not know how to share your faith, I would encourage you to find someone who does and learn from them. Or go through some of those programs. Some are better than others. Make sure you go through a program that really teaches you the real gospel, okay? Not the false gospel, the real gospel. Not a cheap grace gospel, the real gospel. But you must do something. In fact, there are six things you must do according to the passage here. And I'm going to leave these with you, okay? When we think about the gospel. Number one, you must pray. You must pray. Pray for opportunities to share the gospel, Pray for God to give you the words to give to that person. <laughs> if you don't know how to share the gospel, pray for someone that can help you. Um, you know, I've gone out to the park with others, and um, even some of the women that I disciple, they, they say, you know, I don't know how to share the gospel. I said, well, let's hook up with Maggie the Evangelist, and we'll go out. She's, she's a good trainer. You know, and if that's a good opportunity, or to the park or someone, they, they feel awkward, they don't know how to share the gospel. So just let them hang out with you. Number two, you must buy up the time. You must buy up the time. Paul says, redeem the time. There must be a sense of urgency. We have no sense of urgency. You know what we say? Well, I'll share with that neighbor next year. I'll tell my brother next year about the gospel. Or I'll, I'll do this next year tomorrow. One man said, if Christians felt the same urgency to reach others with the, with the gospel as they do about securing their own welfare in this world, our churches would see amazing results. Number three, we must act wisely. We must walk in wisdom. Our walk must be in accordance with our belief. We must live out our faith. You can do more damage to the gospel message by living a life of hypocrisy. Nobody's going to want that what you have if you don't live out what you preach. Number four, you must be gracious. You must be gracious. Now, don't be so gracious that you never open your mouth, okay? Don't do that. But you must be gracious with your speech. Um, you must use things that are, you know, have salt within themselves and so that they're attractive to the unbeliever. Number five, you must be lively, seasoned with salt, your gospel presentation should not be dull. It should not be boring. It should be lively. It should be exciting. Ladies, the gospel of Jesus Christ is truly an amazing and exciting story. <laughs> now, this doesn't mean you leave out repentance. Don't leave out repentance. Don't leave out the lordship of Christ. But you know what? Those things are exciting too. <laughs> They're very exciting. I know. Because when I'm, one of the things that happened to me when I embraced the Lord at the age of 30, all of a sudden all this, this stuff I'd been carrying back here in my neck and my back, all the guilt of my sin, uh, you know, that went away and I finally started sleeping at night. I mean, forgiveness and repentance was huge in my life. Huge. I mean, letting now God and the Lord Jesus Christ be the master of my life instead of me trying to do everything my way. In fact, I think I told you before Christ... My husband used to say, Susan, I'm going to put on your tombstone, she did it her way. And, uh, you know, that, that was an indictment on my life before Christ. Number six, we must be well grounded. We must be well grounded. Paul says we need to know how to answer every man. Now, I would not have a canned gospel, even though I think you should learn the basic facts, but you must be able to answer questions like, what makes Christianity different from other religions? How can I know for sure I have eternal life? How do you know Jesus is the Son of God? And on and on the questions that people will ask you. Now, it doesn't, believe, it doesn't mean that necessarily you have, have to have the Bible mastered, but ladies, you should be pursuing a knowledge of the Scriptures. You should be growing in your understanding of the Bible 
and the gospel. You cannot afford to have status quo when it comes to your walk with Christ. Ladies, we have to buy up opportunities to share our faith. I fear we're going to stand before God someday and be ashamed that we did not buy up the opportunities for the gospel. Will you pray? Will you go? And will you speak? Will you be a woman who pleases the Lord by proclaiming the gospel? A woman who pleases the Lord is personally devoted to Christ. Are you? in the ways we looked at last night. A woman who pleases the Lord is pure. Are you? A woman who pleases the Lord parents God's way. Are you parenting God's way or the world's way? A woman who pleases the Lord puts her spiritual gifts to use. Are you using your spiritual gifts for the glory of God? And lastly, a woman who pleases the Lord proclaims the gospel. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time. I pray that my hurried words have not fallen on deaf ears. I pray that you will take the things that I have said that are true and impress those things upon the hearts and the minds of these women. I pray that you will take anything that I have said in a careless moment and not impress it upon their minds and hearts. But Lord, that they would each of them take away precious principles and truths from your word and your word only. I pray, O oh God, that you would help us to be women who please you in everything we do. And Lord, we know that your word says that by keeping your commandments, this pleases you and it shows our love to you. And I know, Lord, this weekend there is no way that I could cover everything that your word says that we should be doing but we certainly have enough for food for thought. And so I pray, O oh Lord, that we would leave here being um, not just hearers of what has been said, but doers of your word. Give us grace. Give us help from your spirit. Give us the ability to ask each other how we're doing and how we are carrying out the things that we have learned. Father, we do all this not for ourselves, but for the glory of Christ. We want him to be exalted. We want him to be known, and we want him to be glorified. And so we give it to you for Christ's sake. Amen.